so that more people get saved during the tribulation than any other single period of time in history. That's how loving God is. But what's amazing is that's what he wants us to be doing. He wants us to be going into all the world. He wants us to be Christ-loving, Bible-reading, hope-overflowing believers. And that's, that's what we should be in our ever-darkening world. And that's what Revelation was targeting, this representative group. Do you remember where this book went? Primarily, it was addressed by God through Christ to John to send into the church plant circuit, the seven churches that six of them had been planted most likely out from Ephesus. And John was supposed to tell them how they were supposed to live as Christ-loving, Bible-reading, hope-overflowing saints in an ever-dark world. Well, we're in that next section, the tribulation events, and most often we're thinking about all the horrible stuff, but two times God pulls back the veil to show the amazing parts. As the tribulation is unfolding, as a fourth, one out of every four people dies, these 144,000 Jewish evangelists, they're Messianic Jews. You know what I think of them as? Little Apostle Paul. Can you imagine one Apostle Paul? How I mean, he was like the Energizer Bunny. You know, you couldn't get him down. I mean, they even stoned him to death and God raised him up and he kept going. Can you imagine 144,000 of them that can speak every language of the world? That's part of the gift of languages. These 144,000 are able to communicate with every single person on earth, and they don't need machine learning, you know, uh, you know, Bible translation tools. It's part of the supernatural outreach God does during the tribulation. But let, let's look. Here's the whole tribulation uh, uh, roadmap for this section. We have the four horsemen. That's, uh, and, and look in chapter 6. I want you to see it, and we'll, we'll tag them. Now, I saw verse 1 of chapter 6. Uh, by the way, verse 1 of Revelation 6. Now I saw, that means John saw these events happen. The Lamb opened. Jesus is the one that launches the tribulation. The Lamb opened. One of the seals, God has it all planned out, and it's orchestrated, the order. I heard one of the four living creatures. John's actually there witnessing all these events and recorded them, recording them, saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. God wanted him to see that. He wanted him to write it down. He wanted us to know about it. So what do we want to know? Behold, a white horse, and he that sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. But usually, we don't usually say that I, I have a bow. We say I have a bow and what? Arrows, right. Very possible, since every word of God is pure and inspired and God is precise, it's very possible this is saying that this leader, the first one there, the conquering, the white horse, the first seal, see on the left, there are four horsemen. The first horseman most likely represents the Antichrist, and the bow without the arrows means that he conquers the world, probably non-militarily. Probably, there's so much problem, so much famine, so much pestilence, so much unrest, so many powder kegs, you know, between all the different groups on earth and all the rivalries and, uh, you know, how it says uh, that nation will rise against nation, kindred against kindred, and tribe against tribe, all that. There's going to be so much anger and hatred that this, this man arises. And he, he's the Jesus everybody wanted. I mean, he is so winsome, not negative, and just white, you know, and just, you know, the white horse speaks of the purity and the peace, the white dove and all that stuff. He does it. He conquers. But immediately, look at what verse 3 says. And he opened the second seal, and the creature said, come and see, and a fiery red horse went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. So God initiates humans, and, and well, look what happens and that people should kill one another, and there was given them a great sword. This is warfare. This is fighting. So the, the Antichrist launches, and then the peace is shattered by the warfare. Then third, there's this famine. Look at verse 5. And he opened the third seal, and I heard a living creature say, uh, he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, 
And I heard a voice amidst the four creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, do not hurt the oil and wine. Basically, all that strange verbiage says that it's going to take every bit of everybody's time to earn enough money just to have enough food to survive on until the next day. That's what famine is. And that's the third, the black horseman. And then this pale green one in verse 7. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice say, come and see, in a pale horse, chloros. Kind of like chlorine, you know, this, this sickly green color. And the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed him, and power was given over them to kill a fourth of the earth. With sword, that's through all the warfare. With hunger, that's through the famine. With death, that's what happens when you get wounded and starve, you die. And by the beasts of the earth. And Therion, uh, I don't personally believe that means that snakes are going to multiply and lions are going to multiply and bears are going to multiply and you know what I mean, the beasts of the earth. Most likely, this goes back to, do you remember Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the guy in the Netherlands that put some you know, lenses together and started the first microscope and he got a drop of water from the puddle in front of his house and he went, <gasps> and it's recorded in his journals. He said, what? Marvelous beasties. That's what he called the microscopic organisms. So, and, and that word is actually the same, therion, this, the, these little beasts that is used. So probably this is plagues and pestilence. The beasts are pathogens that all together collectively kill a fourth. And then the martyrs uh, in verse 9, uh, the fifth seal, I heard under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God, for the testimony they held. And they cried, how long? And robes were given to each of them, verse 11, they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed, would be completed. So that's the martyr seal, that's the fifth. Then the cosmic changes starts in verse 12. And when he opened the sixth seal, a great earthquake, the sun became black as sackcloth. Uh, verse 13, the stars of heaven fell. Verse 14, wow, the sky recedes like a scroll, and everybody gets scared to death. And then what happens is where we are right now, that block going this way, which says sealing of the 144,000 of the 12 tribes, and that's Revelation 7. So that's where we start in verse 1. It says, after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. And people say, oh, the Bible's false. The earth doesn't have four corners. I know, but any normal person, you buy the most modern car made by any manufacturer, and it will have a compass, and if they have an icon for it within the control panel, it will have four points. And what they're saying is, for us to orient ourselves, we have to think of something in front of us, something behind us, something to our right, and something to our left. And by the way, that's actually in the, the Hebrew language, that's how God gives directions. He gives it like he's sitting on the throne in the temple and in front of him is east. On his left is north. On his right is south. And behind him is west. And that's actually how in Hebrew God gave directions. And he didn't say that the earth was flat and square. But he's talking about the four corners, the four points, as it were, of the compass. But look what happens. And it says the winds don't blow. Well, let's go through this because it's very interesting. Let's study the seventh chapter. The 144,000 Jewish evangelists show God the Savior's missionaries. Okay? Number one, God is always a Savior. The events of chapter 7 explains God's plan to rescue anyone who will respond to his wrath with repentance. Anybody that when the, the Antichrist comes and the warfare comes and the, the, the uh, famines come, and then all of this death and pestilence come. Anybody that gets scared by that and starts reaching out for God, he'll save them. And it's the answer to what the chapter, look how chapter 6 ends. Verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who can survive? Well, there are two groups that can survive. The 144,000 Jewish witnessing evangelists, that's the first eight verses, and their converts. They're still standing. Look, look at chapter 7, verse 9. And after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Remember, that's how God talks about the whole world. Standing. What, what does it say in verse 17 of chapter 6? Who's going to stand? 
they're standing. They're standing before the throne, before the Lamb. They're clothed with white robes. They have palm branches in their hands. They're saying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. What a scene this is. Number one, God is always the Savior. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And as the time of God's wrath begins to pour out on the earth, Jesus launches his evangelists. Now this is not new. God the Savior always has evangelists, okay? In the Old Testament, God himself was evangelist. Do you remember? He's, he's revealing himself to his creation, Genesis 1 and 2, and by the time they fall into sin, who comes looking for them? In Genesis 3, God. God is the one who, remember he said to Adam, where art thou? God was looking for him. Then when Adam and Eve and Enoch heard the gospel, you say heard the gospel? Yeah, that's Genesis 3.15. I'm sure Mark has covered that if he's still teaching Genesis. But that, that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent, that's called the Proto-Evangelium, the first declaration of the gospel. Uh, women don't have seeds, so that was prefiguring the virgin birth of Christ. The seed of the woman would be a virgin-born human, and the human would be injured, Genesis 3.15 says, in his heel. What form of capital punishment usually involves the heel? Not very many. Maybe dragging someone through the streets by their feet, but, but the idea of Christ being crucified, his heel was bruised. But in the process, he crushes the serpent, which Genesis 12 tells us is Satan. So, the gospel is presented to Adam and Eve. Enoch becomes a preacher of righteousness. Uh, so does Noah. The patriarchs were supposed to declare the truth of God. The nation of Israel from Exodus 1 on was supposed to be a light to the nations. And then when they wouldn't do it, they were temporarily replaced by us, the church. God has a future plan for them. Uh, we are the evangelists of the world through Revelation 5, but the 144,000 evangelists start with the launch of the, of the tribulation. They go through their recall in chapter 14. We'll see when we get there. The two witnesses show up as a double. You know, we have the 144,000 evangelizing, then the two witnesses come, and they're in chapter 11. And then by the time we get to chapter 14, an angel is preaching. And wait till we get to that point. I mean, that's amazing to read about. And then, of course, during the millennium, the temple is God's visitor center where he's declaring the truth, but so few will listen. And finally, God, the Savior himself, is with us forever in Revelation 21 22. Secondly, look what it says. And the angels hold the winds of the earth that the wind should not blow. Have you ever thought why God did that? God, through his angels standing at the four points of the compass, briefly stops the atmospheric engine that drives all weather and air purification. That will literally take the breath away from Earth's inhabitants. Why? You know what Daniel 5.23 says? At the high moment before Belteshazzar, Daniel is standing there. The king, it says, his knees are knocking, his face is pale, he's fainting as way up. By the way, Bonnie and I, when, when we were teaching at uh, uh, classes in Paris, we went to the Louvre. The Louvre actually has a beautiful display of the, the beautiful glazed tiles from the audience hall of the Babylonian kings, which means it would have been there. They found it in the excavation. So some of the bricks that saw this event, you can go to the Louvre and see. And the display tells how tall this, the wall was. What they don't mention is up there high, a hand and a finger started writing, you know, about 40 feet up in the air into the wall. And it wrote, you know, uh, many, many tekel ufarsen, the, and it scared the king to death. He'd never seen a hand floating and writing. And so they, they searched out, and they found Daniel, and Daniel's old, and, you know, he's walking in. And they said, what is that? And fearless Daniel looks at that king, and he said, the God who wrote that holds your life's breath in his hand. In other words, only at his allowance do you breathe again. He holds your life's breath. That's 
Daniel 5.23. God does it again for the whole world. He literally takes away the breath from earth's inhabitants to remind them who he is. Think, no breeze, no clouds, no rain, just stale, dusty, humid, smoky, acrid air. It's going to be awful. And then God deploys these evangelists. Uh, Verses 2 and 3, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. The seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. And he says, don't harm the earth, verse 3, the sea or the trees. In other words, don't start unleashing all this, this, these horrible events until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number, and there are listed all the tribes. What's going on? God always seals his own. That's my third observation that I made, because I'm studying this with you. I'm just typing out mine, and I hope you're typing out yours. Don't forget, you have to read the book of Revelation. That's a very high percentage of your grade. You have to do that project. That's half of your grade. You have to memorize those two verses. And then you have these two little quizzes. So don't, and then you have a final exam. So don't forget all that. My wonderful wife said, honey, remind them. So did I remind them? She sits over there and prays for me because of my phonographic mind. Uh, that what I talk about is what you need to hear. Because I could actually talk about anything. Um, I can remember just about everything I've ever seen and read. I can tell you the pages on my books where all this stuff comes from. I can see the pages of my Bible in my mind. So I have to be very careful what I talk about. And so I'm praying that the Lord will guide me because there's someone here that needs to hear, especially today's lesson. And so that's why she sits through the classes and... uh, Praise for me over there. God knows who belongs to him. Let me read to Ephesians 1 and verse 14. It's a great verse. Uh, A lot of the verses I share with you are part of the verses that that I've memorized and they're part of my life. And uh, they really are the framework for everything that I do and believe. But it says in in Ephesians 1.14, Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? What is that? Back up to verse 13 in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So everybody that gets saved are baptized by the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit is done by God. It's the baptism all of us have exactly the same. We're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, and he seals us. Now, what that ceiling is like is, uh, look at Ezekiel 9. This is fascinating. Remember, there's nothing new. And uh, in Revelation, it's just all going back. In Ezekiel 9, uh, verses 3 and 4, now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub. This is the the death throes of of the kingdom of Judah. Uh, They're going to be deported. But before they're deported, before the temple's destroyed, the presence of God leaves the temple. You all remember that. And the glory Shekinah cloud goes up from the the Ark of the Covenant and it hovers over the temple. Then it moves and goes to the eastern gate. And then it goes and floats off toward the east. So you remember all that. But look what happens just before that event. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called a man clothed with linen who had a writer's ink cord on his side. And this is about where Many people reading through the Old Testament are going, boy, this is confusing, I don't understand what's going on here. Persist. Look what verse 4 says. And the Lord said, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads. Where does the Antichrist mark? Forehead and right hand. See, even the mark of the beast is, is copying something God does. Only this one is invisible. Put a mark on the forehead of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done in it. What is going on? Well, if you've read the other parts of Ezekiel, you know that that the nation has descended into sun worship and idol worship. And they're even doing it in the temple. And whenever a true believer, a follower of the God of the universe, went by the temple, they didn't like the temple anymore because it was ruined. Because they had this sun worship and they were bowing down and making cakes to the pagan gods and bowing toward the east and all this 
horrible stuff they were doing in their wickedness and their apostasy. And those people, look what it says. They sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done. God wants us to grieve over sin, not grow accustomed to it. And they demonstrated by their reaction that they were really believers. And God knew they were really believers, but we find out they're really believers because of this internal hatred of sin. So if, if you want to know if you're really a Christian, not if your mom says, don't worry, you prayed. No. Do you want to really know if you really are born again? Do you have an internal hatred of sin? When I was at Bob Jones University, I was, uh, I was on the administration. I was the assistant dean of men, and I loved it and everything else. Did you know every year we had an incoming class of 12, 1,300 freshmen? Every year, incoming classes. Did you know about half of them? No, it was 20%. So Because we, we usually got about 300. So a fourth of them would get saved during the evangelistic meeting. They had just come along with mom and dad and just agreed with everything, but they got to college and all of a sudden they said, wow, I'm not sure, you know, this isn't working. I don't understand the Bible. I don't really like the Bible. In fact, I love sin more than other stuff. And so we would, the first week of school was evangelistic meetings. You know what one of the greatest evidences of salvation is? You hate sin because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. If you don't hate sin, you're either sick or you're not saved. I mean, that's simple, okay? But look what happens. And the, he said in verse 5, To the others he said, My hearing, go after him to the city and kill. Do not spare, utterly slay old men, young men, but do not come near anyone who has the mark. What is this? This is the run-up before the Babylonian captivity. God went through the inkhorn, the angel. No one saw this. God did it. He let Ezekiel know about it and write it down. God marked every true believer, and when the Babylonians came through, they were murdering everybody and killing them, and all of a sudden, for some reason, they'd let that one go, and they'd keep killing and murdering, they'd let that one go. God was preserving a remnant to go into the Babylonian captivity, to take all the scroll. Do you ever wonder how you have a copy of the Bible, why it didn't get destroyed by the Babylonians? Because God marked the believers, they had the scriptures, they suffered, you know, they had to walk barefooted and chained, and they went all the way to Babylon, but they carried with them the scrolls. How did they survive? God put a mark on them. Why do nations come and kill and pillage and plunder and murder and rape and everything else? Because Satan came to kill and steal and destroy. Satan is behind all of this. He is the one that, that causes war. He's the real God of war. He's the real God of murder. He's the real God of everything to do against God. But he can't. He can't overpower anything God does. And God marked all the believers, and the Babylonians just systematically killed everyone except the ones God wanted to make it to Babylon. Isn't that interesting? You say, why are you telling us all this? That's an Old Testament thing, and you're not supposed to teach Ezekiel. That's somebody else's job. Well, for this reason, look at Revelation 2 and 3. God knows who belongs to him. He's always sealed them, just like back in Ezekiel. And here God declares these witnesses are his, and he seals them with his name. That's why everything in Revelation connects back to something else in the Bible. That's why I love this book. You have to be studying the whole Bible to understand Revelation. And when you understand Revelation, all of a sudden the whole Bible makes sense. I used to tell the students, back when Bonnie and I weren't traveling so much, I used to carry, when I would teach this class, a box that was a jigsaw puzzle box, and I would come up to start the class, and I'd be shaking the box, and the students could hear it. And I would walk back and forth like this, shaking my box of jigs jigsaw puzzles. And then my, my assignment would be, I'd open the box, and I'd have a couple students come up front, and I'd say, reach in and get a piece, and hold your piece, and describe to all the other students what the puzzle looks like. You can't figure out what a puzzle looks like from one of the 1,000 funny-shaped little pieces. And while they were all standing facing, I would hold the box up that they couldn't see. And all of you could see. And all of a sudden, all of you knew what the picture was, but none of them holding one little piece could understand. And I said, now what you've just seen is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation takes the thousand pieces scattered across the whole Bible and makes it one picture. It's like the picture on the box of the jigsaw puzzle. 
So all of a sudden, what's going on here, and look at 2 Corinthians 1. Let me get there. 2 Corinthians 1. Paul even further enlarges this in verse 22. Well, I'll start in verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us as God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And so Paul's talking about the fact God always seals his own. Why am I spending so much time on that? Did you hear all this? The Holy Spirit is the one that is the down payment, the, the sealing one. He is the agent of redemption. He is the agent of regeneration. How, how are we supposed to handle that? Well, look at this. Beware of ever grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Now, let's look at Ephesians 4.30. Remember, the people getting this letter had the book of Ephesians. And they knew what it says in chapter 4, verse 30. And do not grieve. Present active. Okay? Present active imperative. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Beware of ever grieving the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, let me ask you, why do some believers not feel like getting into the Bible? When Bonnie and I were, were uh, newlyweds, you know, we, we moved to California, started working at Grace Community Church uh, after, let's see, Johnny was born uh, in 1985, and we were married in 83, so after, you know, about a year and a half, we had this beautiful little boy and we were scared to death. You come home from the hospital and they're so fragile and, and uh, they're all wrapped up in that blanket. You don't want to unwrap them because you don't know what to do. I mean, it's scary and you have this baby and you've never had one before and everything. And so we, Bonnie was great and she took care of him and he was thriving until one day, I don't know, he was like three months old, he started this horrible, they call it the croup. What an awful uh, sound a baby makes. <coughs> You know, they're coughing, this horrible cough. We thought, sure, he was dying, you know. And so back then, doctors had phone numbers, and we actually called the doctor. And the doctor actually answered. Shows how long ago it was. And he said, uh, yep, we held the phone. He said, yeah, yeah, croup, don't worry. Turn the shower on, get it, you know, the water running, steaming. Walk around in the bathroom, close the door with him, let him breathe that in. And he says, bring him in on Monday. I said, Monday, it's Friday night, he might die. He said, he won't die. I said, why? He said, I asked your wife already. Is he still hungry? She said, oh, yeah, he's ravenous. He's very hungry. He eats all he can eat. He said, if they have an appetite, don't worry. Just bring him in on Monday. He said, he'll get better. Hey, that's true spiritually. If you don't have an appetite, if it is like pulling teeth, to read this thing. And if reading it is the single most boring thing you can think of, and you only do it because someone paid and you've got to finish out this term, you know, and you're going to do it and just barely make it by, you are exhibiting a lack of hunger. That means you, are, you need to go to the hospital. You are desperately, your croup is serious. It's all about your hunger and thirst for God. Why do believers sometimes feel like not getting into the Word? Or worse, why do Christians sometimes not even feel saved? I was a pastor for 38 years. Do you know what I found out? The number one thing, people make an appointment, they say I have a question about the Bible, or I have a question about you know something, and they get into your office, and as soon as the secretary shuts the door, they lean forward and they say, I said, well, I want to talk to you about your question about prophecy, or, oh, no, they said, that doesn't matter. Then they start usually getting very emotional, and they say, I don't think I'm a Christian. I don't feel like a Christian. I feel horrible and everything. And so I tried, you know, after about the 100th time this happens, you know, over the decades, you want to jump in. But I wait till they get all done with that. And I, I act, you know, right with them. And I go, and they finally look up and I say, but was there ever a time you thought you were a Christian? Oh, yes. They said, oh, I remember. I used to, you know, I was, and they usually give their testimony. I was saved, you know, here and there, and I served the Lord. And I said, but now I don't feel like a Christian. I said, well, the good news is if you ever were a Christian, you still are because you can't get unchristian, okay? Then they start listening. And you know what usually you find out? Ephesians 4.30. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. If you do, 
you will not like this book. Because remember, this book will keep you from sin, but sin will keep you from this book. And you won't have any hunger for it. And also, you will not feel like a Christian. Okay, let me go through this quickly. Flesh-led living grieves the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you a question. Are you spirit-led or flesh-led? I mean, you should constantly be thinking about this. In fact, all of you who are going to be in any type of ministry should constantly be thinking about this because you are supposed to be involved in spiritual health care. Anybody in ministry is, is watching over parts of Christ's flock. It doesn't matter whether you're in children's ministry or adult ministry or youth ministry or, or evangelistic ministry. It doesn't matter what it is. We're, what we're hoping is to keep the believers healthy so they reproduce and lead other people to Christ and that people come to Christ and grow. We don't want any failures to thrive. That's what they call children that, that, that aren't hungry and there's something wrong with them and they're sick. They're not thriving. It was, it's normal for you to thrive, for your body to be growing, for things to be developing, for your mind. Everything just is, you're thriving. We're aware of that in the physical world, in the medical world, but we, we kind of forget about that in the spiritual world. All of you here are either thriving or not. You're either flesh-led or spirit-led. So how can you tell the difference? Well, Galatians 5. So grab your Bible, Galatians 5. See, every, every good question the Bible addresses, you know, because God already knows everything we need to know. Look what it says in Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. That's the Spirit-led life. And you will not fulfill the lust of flesh. That's the flesh-led life. So you see, it's one or the other. God is very black and white. So, spirit-led, you have attitudes that other people can see. People that are close to you, if they're godly, they see these things. Love and joy and peace and long-suffering. You say, wait a minute, I know that list. I've already memorized that. You're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Yes, what is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is a personality transplant. God transplants the personality of Christ into me. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's me living and acting and responding a little more every day by the power of the Spirit to be Christ-like. So, I have loving, joyful, peaceful, long-suffering, kind, good, faithful attitudes. My actions, I want to eat the Word. I want to share the Gospel. I mean, I couldn't imagine uh, not sharing this. I mean, I'm, remember the story I told you about the guy on the airplane? As soon as he knew it was crashing, he undid his seatbelt and went right down the aisle. I mean, he knew his next stop was heaven, and he wanted to take as many people as possible with him. See, that's, we, we boldly witness we're generous givers. We realize everything we give to the Lord lasts forever. So if you've got an investment with, with an eternal return, you just want to get as much in there as possible. And you, you have these personal disciplines because we are supposed to reflect Christ in every part of our life, so we keep trying to surrender more of our life to get it under his control. But what does the flesh-led life look like? Well, attitudes show up quite regularly. Anger, wrath, anxiety, fear. God does not, is not the author of fear. In fact, one of the people that God describes as headed to hell are the fearful and the unbelieving. And on and on goes the list in Romans 1 and in Revelation 21 and many other places. Fear is not from God, it's from the devil. We are supposed to fear not. But there's only one way to fear not. It's by the power of the Spirit. Selfish, irritated, bitter. Our actions were quick to lie and steal and be immoral and lazy and sarcastic and erratic and restless and self-focused. So the Spirit-led life, when filled and led and controlled by the Spirit, these emotions and actions and attitudes are revealed. We have this peace and hope and love and boldness and holiness and passion. We're sensitive. We're self-sacrificing. We hunger for the Word. We hate sin. Is that us? No. That is the transplanting of God within us by the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit is leading our lives, that's what we look like. But when the Spirit is not leading our lives, when we're filled and led and controlled by the flesh, our attitudes and actions and emotions are revealed. We have anxiety, we have fear, we are selfish, we're lethargic, we're disinterested in the Word, we have no passion for the lost, we're irritable with people, we get bitter, we won't forget, forgive other people, and we're very moody. Kind of like King Saul, you know, got so angry he threw a spirit at his number one warrior. I mean, he's very moody. 
So what I'm saying is, our emotions betray who is leading us. The Holy Spirit or our fallen flesh. See, we, we are in a body of flesh that has been filled with this new operating system, the Holy Spirit, and the place between our body and the new us, the regenerated us, the, the meeting grounds between that, the storm center is our emotions. And that shows what's going on. It's kind of like when Bonnie and I served in Oklahoma. You had the warm, humid Gulf air coming up from the south, and you had the cold Arctic air coming down, and they seemed to meet over the plains, Oklahoma specifically, uh, where the tornadoes were. Con I mean, we, we just had constant, really violent weather. That's like the meeting place is our emotions, and our emotions betray who is leading us. And so if we have a spirit-led life, a spirit-led mind leads to spirit-ruled emotions. Isn't it interesting how God describes us? You know what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body. When God looks at us, he sees an immortal, infinite, born from above, regenerated spirit, and he sees our emotions that are to be under the control of that spirit, and then he sees our body, which is going to struggle the whole time. And remember, be going the wrong direction, backing toward heaven. That's what our body wants to do. It doesn't want to go to heaven. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't want to go there. It's not from there, and it wants to stay in the world. And God turned us around, but our body's resisting. So it starts with our spirit-led mind, Romans 7, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. Our spirit ruled when we surrender. Emotions become loving and joyful and peaceful and gentle and kind and patient and bold and long-suffering. And our body more and more surrendered, denies ungodliness, avoids sins, focus on serving God. But boy, that's not how the flesh-led life is. Everything starts with the body, not the spirit, not the mind. No, no, no. It's a restless body. It's an undisciplined body. See, the body is controlling everything. It's an appetite-driven body. It's a lust-filled, never satisfied, and constantly defeated by sin body. And you know what that does to the storm center, to the emotions? The person with flesh-driven emotions is volatile and lethargic and anxious and angry and troubled and distracted and impure. And it leads to a spirit-quenched mind. That's what grieving the spirit means. There's no stability, no boldness, no insights into the word, no hunger for God, no joy in the spirit, just an aimless, no confident, empty life. Masquerading among other Christians. Knowing enough to get along, but down deep, miserable. So that's why all this is so important. Well, back to Revelation 7. I'm not teaching the epistles. I'm sure someone's already thought that. So let me go to Revelation 7. Because we're sealed, and what I just shared with you is the byproducts of that sealing. But look at verse 4. And I heard the number of those sealed. And all of a sudden, God always wanted Israel to be his light to the nations. That's what Romans 11 is about. That God chose Israel to be his light to the world. And now Jews begin turning to Christ from every tribe. Zechariah 12 talks about that. See, the Old Testament, that piece in the puzzle box, all of a sudden you see it on the cover in the book of Revelation. And what marks this is verse 9, the final super evangelism event. I already read it to you. All these people standing there with the palm branches and the white robes. It's the greatest ever evangelism event. God uses 144,000 Jewish evangelists and the two witnesses and the gospel angels to be sure that everyone on earth hears the plan of salvation. Why? Well, they declare it in verse 10. Just as Jonah reminds us, salvation is of the Lord. So now all of heaven is declaring God is the Savior. He is the initiator and the accomplisher of salvation. Look at verse 10. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Wow. Wow. Well, let me just share with you a little bit about how wonderful it is to go through life believing all this. Denying ungodliness, worldly lusts, asking the Holy Spirit to fill us, asking the Holy Spirit to make us joyful and peaceful and fearless and bold and, and seeking to be in step with the Spirit. I remember uh, Bonnie and I started out after we were with, uh, out in California. We went to New England. We were sent out. And 
my mentor pastor came and installed me in this historic church in Rhode Island called Quidneset. And I went there and it was a lovely church and, and it was an amazing place. And I just started doing what I knew how to do and I just started teaching through the Bible verse by verse and I started teaching and all of a sudden, about three or four months into our ministry there, we lived in a parsonage built by the DuPont family in 1828 and it was this beautiful pastoral, like a mansion house, but it was you know, almost 200 years old, so it didn't have any hallways. You remember they heated with fireplaces. There was a fireplace in the center that opened into every room on each floor. And although they'd put in heating, they didn't put in fireplaces. So you had to walk through another room. To go from our room to the bathroom, you had to walk either through this, you know, nursery room or through this bedroom and vice versa. So it was just a very unusual house. When the phone rang, which was downstairs, screwed on the wall, that's how phones were, they weren't in your pocket, they were screwed on the wall and they had this long cord. And when you wanted to talk to someone, you had to stretch the cord as long as possible and hide, you know, so no one could hear you. So here's that phone down there, all the bedrooms were upstairs, the phone is shrilling downstairs and it started ringing at exactly two o'clock every morning. Every day. The phone would start ringing at two. You couldn't take the phone off the wall because it would go, eh, eh, it was worse, so I just learned. I started waking up at 1.59, and I'd start walking quietly not to wake up any of the kids in their cribs and headed down and would try not fall down the stairs, and I would get there, and I'd pick the phone up, and every day it was the same thing. You dirty, rotten, F-wording, D-word, F-word, and every other word they could think of, and I'd say, can I help you? And they'd go, I'd say, okay, I've got to go, and I would hang up every day. Ring, lift, swear, 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 swear. Can I help you? I'm hanging up now. Every day. Well, you know, even though I was half asleep and everything, about the fourth or fifth time, I actually recognized that voice. Well, concurrent with that, something started happening. Every week, when I would say in my message, there was a balcony in this church, I would have my Bible, I'd say, in conclusion, it was almost like a torpedo. This person in the very back row would, I mean, they'd come out of their chair so fast, they looked like they'd just been launched. And they would come down the balcony stairs and I'd see them go out. Well, I mean, I'm a slow learner. So I think about three weeks of the phone ringing at 2 o'clock and the torpedo guy, I asked the chairman of the elders, I said, I'm going to do something. I said, I'm going to walk down the aisles I'm teaching and as I'm teaching, I'm going to say, now we're going to be closing prayer and Norm's going to close this. And I'm going to go stand by the only door out of the balcony and find the torpedo man. So I did that. And real quickly, I, I said, in conclusion, but I was already in front of the door, torpedo, down came this, down the stairs as fast as possible. And I stood in the middle and he had his head down like this. And I said, hello. And he said, hello. And looked up and I said, I recognize your voice. You're my 2 a.m. caller. I wanted to hear you talk. And he looked down, and I said, I really want to talk to you. To make a long story short, my 2 a.m. caller, his name was Al. He was a practicing homosexual who had had 600 different partners. In the process, he had contracted AIDS. Our church had an inner city clinic. He had gone to our church with our lovely doctors and nurses who did free AIDS tests back then before the government was doing it. And, and it was secret and they put it in an envelope and he tested positive and they slid it across to him. And of course, the, all the confidentiality and he became angry. And he became angry at our church because we're the ones that told him he was dying. And he became angry at God because the wages of sin is death. And to make all that story, I mean, he didn't just do that. His group had broken into our church, stolen the sound equipment, had broken into our church, and had on the white walls sprayed in like eight-foot-high letters, every four-letter thing you can think of, had broken into our bus and started to fire and burn the Sunday school bus. I mean, they were very much opposed to the gospel. And now I'm talking to them. And so, to make a long story short, uh, we met several times. The last time, I'll never forget, I just said, Al, what would keep you from right now crying out to Christ, asking him to save you? And it was almost like this pent-up 
He just went, Aah. he said, nothing. He says, I just feel so dirty. I can't imagine God could forgive me. I said, he will. And he was gloriously saved. Well, then we had to baptize him. This is the early days of AIDS. We did baptisms all the time. His group said they were going to come and disrupt the service. So the Rhode Island State Troopers, you ever seen Rhode Island State Troopers? They have leather shiny boots that go up like to their knees or beyond. They're really rugged looking. They're all like 6'4", and they wear, they don't just have those little guns, they wear the big ones, you know. And so our whole service had these, they look like, you know, the Wehrmacht or something from Germany. They were guarding our service. And Al, the elder said, he has to be last. He has AIDS, and we don't know how they transmit AIDS. The chairman of the elders was like 80 years old. While I had Al coming up to give his testimony by the uh, microphone, which everyone gives their testimony before we baptize him, which really encourages the body, I heard this water running sound, and I looked. He had a gallon of bleach, and he was going, he was pouring Clorox into the baptistry, hoping to kill the AIDS virus, you know, as if Clorox in the baptistry would keep me from getting AIDS from Al. I mean, can you imagine such love that they were trying to take care of me? But Al shared his testimony, the most glorious testimony. And he, he told the whole story about calling and hating and all the disruption he did. And he said, now I've come to Christ. See, that is why the 144,000 go out when earth is at its worst. Because when people in the dark hear the love of Christ, they start shouting. Look at verse 10. Salvation is of the Lord, our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And they all fell on their faces and worshipped. Well, more people get saved after the rapture in huge numbers than any other time. This multitude is saved from the tribulation. They were not taken out by Christ at the rapture. They're saved in his wrath. And God is with us forever. And that's what verses 15 to 17 in their song says. And so that leads us to where we're going next. You go from chapter 7 into these trumpets. And the first trumpet, a third of all trees and grass are burned, and then this mountain of fire hits the sea and destroys a third of the sea, and then this something poisons all the water and the darkness, and, and basically what the Bible says is Revelation 8 is all about the heavens shaking. It's kind of fulfillment of Luke 21. It starts by God waiting and it says in verse 1, when they opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And God waits, almost like saying, I'm giving you time to repent. And it just shows how patient Jesus is, how he waits. He's not willing that any should perish. But before his throne, there's an amazing silence as the voices of myriads of angels and heavenly creatures and the saints all are strangely silent. But the silence starts the events. At, after the half hour, verse 2, the seven angels were given trumpets. Verse 3, they take the prayers of all the saints. Remember I told you they're in that bowl. And now they start being poured out. And God's wrath starts. And the birth pangs we saw in Matthew 24 are going to get big. The trumpets are more deadly than the seals. They're not as deadly as the bowls. And as we'll see when we come back, they ruin everything.